got a choice there, huh? All right, here we go. All right, everybody, and welcome to Rangers Nation's podcast. Today's episode is Jamie Newberg. Like I said in the intro, you know Jamie Newberg from The Athletic. He's also the creator of the Newberg Report for a lot of us nerds out there that go way back. Jamie, thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, you bet. So, um, listen, so we, we've talked a little bit this morning, and uh, we've met maybe once or twice, but we don't know each other well. You grew up here in Dallas. You went to Dallas Hillcrest. Uh, right. Were you born and raised here? I know? was. I've spent my entire life in the Dallas area except for college and law school, which were both in Austin. Both in Austin. That's, now, we talked about this a little earlier. You played Dallas BBI, and for any – Jamie and I are about the same age. I'm one year older than you, I think. Chris Hill's your age, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm a year older than you. Um, but back in the old days of Jamie and I, there was no select baseball. So if the, anything close to select baseball was Dallas BBI baseball. And uh, we actually played against a few people and, uh, and played with some people in the same. Now, one of the names – now, you know J.P. Tovar, right? Did you play oh, yeah. against him? I know, I know J.P. well. Was he on the Jaguars back then? He was on the Jaguars, and I played against him in chamber before that, and he was a W.T. White, and that was our rival. And <laughs> yeah, I've known J.P. forever. You know, I was going to ask you, I played with a lot of guys and against them. At, at, I went to Dallas BBI for about three years, went back. I was – you sent me that. Jamie was a stud, apparently. I, I did not quite go to that level. Dallas BBI was above my skill level. I, I realized that pretty quickly. Did you ever play – if you were at Dallas BBI, did y'all play TJ? And uh, you played – you obviously played WTY. Did you play TJ also? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I faced Morris Moss, Mike Moskry, Rodney Jenks. Like, <laughs> that whole TJ crew, we were convinced every one of them was going to be a big leaguer. Oh, my God. That's the names I was about to bring up. Morris yeah. Moss – buckled my knees with a curveball one of course he looked scary the way he came off that mound like club but all right yeah. so anyway so you played with chris hill did you play with david need that's why i did not I play with david need i played against david um but chris hill and i were teammates in bbi and brian jones was another name he's the coach over at uh what's he at now he's over he's at, a jesuit now yeah jesuit i played uh with brian uh boy those guys those groups were the bandits we used to play they were yeah. good yeah, that was a Brian great. Jones, a heck of a player, also W.T. White with J.P. Yeah. Now, so one of the names you and I taught, we kind of brought up, the, a name that I remember always, I didn't play against this guy. He was a year, year or two older than me, was uh, Livingston. Living, uh, Scott Livingston. Scott Livingston. I saw that guy hit a ball at, Bur at Buckner. Did y'all play at Buckner? We did, yeah. yeah. That big field at Buckner was the first time I'd ever seen a guy hit a ball. And the moment you hit it, you were like, holy, kids this age can hit a ball that far? That guy I want to say, you may, you may know better than me, but I want to say Livingston was either 84 or 85. 84. Um, okay, so he was, a, that's, uh, he was a senior when I was a freshman. And as a freshman, I was Hillcrest's second baseman. So I'm this, yeah. Right. So I'm this little, you know, 140-pound, <laughs> you know. And, of course, when you're a freshman, the seniors seem eight years older than you are anyway, oh, yeah. just like socially. Yeah, but Livingston was a left-handed hitter, and I remember yep. him and Howard Prager, same age as W.T. White. The two of them were lefties. I thought they were going to kill me when I was playing second base. I wanted so bad to be on the warning track <laughs> and not get not get a ball that just knocked me flat. But uh, he was heck of a player, and he had some major league run. Yeah, he bit. did. Played for a while. In fact, I think he got drafted out of high school, but he ended up going to A and M. Is where he Correct. ended up and That's got drafted right. out of there. Hey, where does, where does your love of baseball come from? I know you're a bit – does your dad – was he a big baseball guy? No, not really. My, my dad's an insane football fan. Okay. And so was I. I was too growing up. Um, but baseball, I mean, partly, especially if you're my age and grew up in the area, you know, you got one, sometimes fewer than one Ranger game on TV a week. Oh, yeah. But I was always listening on the radio, and that was always the sport that I gravitated toward as a player. Like, yeah. that's the one that – you know, when it was summertime, I was outdoors for 10 hours playing street ball with my buddies. Like, that's – I think baseball grabbed me first more yeah. than football just because of that. But in terms of, like, you know, Cowboy Sundays were, like, family holidays. Oh, that yeah. Like, that's what we were all – we were a football family. But that's – I think that's how baseball grabbed me, just being on the diamond. Yeah, and, you know, that that's amazing because I, I, I was a big fan of all sports, too. I ended up playing – I was a little bit better at football by the time I graduated high school. Played baseball at Duncanville. You know, in our as our age, Duncanville back then was known for baseball. They were baseball and girls basketball back then. 
So I was I got lost in the shuffle. We had some way better players. I don't know if you knew the names Glenn Ortega and Bart Alfred and Michael Martin, and then you knew Needon Hill. They were your age, mm -hmm. uh, but we had some studs that played there that came before us and after. But uh, wasn't Chris Eddy there? Chris Eddy was there. Chris was a couple years younger than me. Gotcha. I, I remember. I remember him. Yeah, yeah. Chris came out. He he had a little swim with the A's. I think. Uh, yeah. Chris did. There, there's a few Dunkerville players that that went up and, and, and there. So let me ask you this. You talk about Max all the time. Max is big time ball player. Did he make, did he make uh, varsity this year or what did he no, make? No, JV. Um, and sadly, uh, even though he made the JV, it was with uh, the understanding that he wasn't going to be ready physically. He's, yeah. His arm has been shut down since May. Oh no. Um, so almost a year now, uh, he had a, a stress fracture in his growth plate in the shoulder area. Oh my gosh. And um, so he's been rehabbing that for nearly a year. He's good now, but there's nowhere to play. Oh. But the, the, the likelihood was that he was not going to get on the field until maybe the last month of the high school season, which obviously got wiped out. Um, but so, yeah, he made the JV, but he was really just, you know, doing fielding drills without throwing and swinging a bat in practice, but not getting into games because he was not, uh, he wasn't physically ready for it. That's a shame. So, I mean, I know he plays, he plays select ball with the Pelicans. I see a lot of stuff that you'll put out there. And I've, I've actually got a son that is Max's age. He does not play ball. But uh, we're – Jamie and I live in the same school district. My son goes where uh, Mike Tovar coaches. Uh, I'm not throwing out where all we live and all of that. But Mike Tovar is the head coach. So, you do y'all work out over there when with the yeah. Pelicans? Oh, yeah. So, um, so we – my my kid got into the theater magnet over there, which you're a theater dad also. So we get right. into dad talk. So yeah. I actually went and saw your daughter. Is she at Indiana? Is that where she at now? She she did her first year at Indiana and transferred to SMU. She's at SMU now. Are you teaching her? <laughs> yeah. No. She uh, although she just she has threatened to enroll in my class. I'm not <laughs> sure who that'll be worse for her or me. Probably worse for me. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you. I mean, uh, that is something I know you probably are like me, growing up a sports fan. I never imagined I would be a theater dad uh, oh. growing up but one of the biggest rewards I've ever had it is the neatest thing in the world to watch um, you know I don't think I went to one theater production in high school even though I had friends that were in theater like I never went never had never felt like I was missing out really didn't yeah. know anything about it um, but I mean you know if you've got a kid in it like when when our daughter was you know one semester into the program um, at her high school I was like, I was swept in and like, once she got older and started getting, you know, more, uh, featured parts. Oh my gosh. Like they put on eight or nine performances for a particular show over a couple of weeks. I never missed one. Oh, like no. I wanted to see it all nine times. And, yeah. and I still go back to the high school shows, even though she's gone, I still go whenever they put a show on because the program's so good. So I, it, it it's amazing that, up. yeah, it's amazing that my son's school is considered the theater magnet because the ones at the school, you, I still go to those too. I went before uh, Erica was ever Eponine. Is that what the name of it oh, was yeah. that I saw before I, yeah. I, I would go and still go back and try to catch. I have a friend that was teaching over there. He's retired now. That was a teacher over there. Uh, uh, but I, I'm telling you, she was so talented and I have a son that does that. And you end up as a dad like us that we can't coach him at this. We'll, you need us to move furniture or something. That's really all I could do was that, take you tickets. Know what? It's funny you say that. That to me was maybe the most, I get chills even thinking about it right now. The greatest part of being a theater dad for me was knowing she created this talent by yes. herself. Yep. My, my wife wasn't in, in the arts. I yep. wasn't. Um, so this was all Erica and like to just to see her do what she did, knowing it wasn't something like, you know, everybody like laughs that Max is so into baseball. They, they assume that I, like he had no choice. Yes, um, exactly. Not that it was really like that, but it was always on TV in the house when he was sure. young, but there was nothing like that for Erica to be drawn into theater as like a family birthright. It was sure. all her. Yeah. And, and, and I'm going to brag on Erica right now. Let me say, and, I, and on my son for a second, I, my son got into doing some theater and he did some stuff at the Plano Children's Theater and they did this, they did Les Mis. And that's the show I was talking about. By far my favorite musical. I'm talking musicals on a baseball podcast. But I went and saw the professional Les Mis down here in downtown Dallas. And I saw the one that, that they did over at your, with, with uh, Erica in it. 
that is my favorite performance I've ever seen of it. Those wow. kids, and she was amazing, but those kids were amazing. That was an I'm, amazing setup. Totally agree with you. And I'm going to have to share this podcast with the director over there. She'll, she'll love to hear that. Cause I mean, I, I'm biased, but I, I totally agree. Like I've, I've seen a couple other renditions of it, both, you know, looking on YouTube and, and attending one. Yep. Yeah. I thought we're really good, but I'd go see, yep. I'd go see the high school do it again. <laughs> Man, it was amazing. Okay. So we did that. Now let me, let me ask you this. Do you remember the first Ranger game you ever went to? Um, sort of. The one thing I remember about it, it was bat night and bat night in the mid seventies, you got a bat. You didn't get a voucher. No, you got a bat. Um, Cause I remember by like age nine or 10, we, we would instead get a piece of paper to take to Kroger to go get the bat. Yeah. But the first game I went to, and I think we chose it because it was bat night. I mean, there were, I don't know, maybe 25,000 people there and yep. two thirds of them had a wooden bat just banging them on the seat. I mean, it was like, it, you almost couldn't hear the game because the, the, the bat <laughs> clanging was so loud. But that's what I remember about the game. I don't know who we played. I don't know mm -hmm. whether we won or who did what. I remember the bats. Yeah, mine was 1974. Grandfather, now deceased. Dad, now deceased. Took me and my uncle, who's a few years older than us. He, he kind of grew up like a big brother to me. Well, he took us. He was about 12. I was about six or seven. And all I, I don't know who won. I don't know... What happened? All I know is I walked in there, and to me, it was like Yankee Stadium. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing I have ever seen. And, yeah. boy, we would go back to so many. I just loved it. So, you – now, from there, how, I've got a story how I got into minor league players and prospects. How did you get into the minor leagues? That's your kind of what you're known for. What got you into that? I wonder I really, if it's what mine was. I don't know that there's a <laughs> like an, a tangible answer that I can come up with for that. I do know that – um, I subscribed to Baseball America as soon as I knew what that was, and I got really interested. I, I, I was a, like, I, I want to say that that first Ranger game I went to was 75 or 76, which is 76 is also when I got into baseball cards, and that's probably about when I started listening to, you know, Mark Holtz call, his, call the games yep. every night. And so I'm becoming like this, this Rangers fan that wants more because they're not on right. TV every day. They're definitely, I mean, it's clearly a football town. Um, and so I think the minor leagues was like, okay, this differentiates baseball some where I can kind of say, are there players coming that are going to make these 77 Rangers a better team in 78 or 79? Like, it's different. You know, NFL, like, I, when we're, while we're recording this, we're a day away from the draft. Yeah. And so a lot of people are very into, okay, who could be – you know, where's Tua going or who's who the Cowboys going to take on defense. But like in baseball, you know, three or four years in advance, who's coming up that pipeline. It's not like they're drafting, get plugged into the big league team. So I think that's what drew me yeah. is like, I wanted to, the, I was, I was such a passionate Rangers fan that I wanted to know, our, okay, we never even fight for a division title. When's <laughs> that going to happen? <laughs> what do we have coming where, you know, we're on our way to be being contenders. And so that's, I think that's what drew me first in terms of, you know, the baseball America stuff and like everything I could get to try to figure out yeah. who the up and coming players were. And that, that's funny. That's exactly with me. I'm about the same time you were, I really got into him. We did not have major league baseball that was exciting to watch. They were never really in it by the all-star break. They were usually out. So all you could ever hear was they've got this kid. Um, you know, they've got this kid at so-and-so or wherever. And so that's how I started trying to follow up. And you would hear about, and my uncle, who was the one I was telling you about, lived out near Odessa. And so every time Tulsa came to town, he would tell me about, well, there's this kid named David Hulse that's playing for Tulsa, or there's this catcher named Rodriguez that, you know, and so you'd be watching these names and that, because look, you're the, for, for people like what I do, uh, I'm with Dallas Sports Nation. I do this. I, I'm kind of, you're the beginner of all of this. For some of us that come after you, we don't do this for a living. You, you get paid to do this. That's fantastic. I think that's wonderful. You get paid to do it. But it's not your living. You have a career. You're a lawyer. I do. I'm in a real estate investment company, and I do all of that stuff. This is for just love. I just enjoy doing it. It's a lot of fun. And minor leagues was kind of a thing I was following. And so when you came along, I, I found you because of Mike Reiner. 
And that's kind of the big thing. I, I wished I had knew you originally. I would have been a part of your first email blast. I would have been like, yeah. send it to me. I got my own dadgum opinions. You're not going to like them. You know, we'd go that <laughs> <way>. <laughs> yeah. was Lucas a part of your first one? I, he was not on the mailing list um, at the beginning. <laughs> and he definitely wasn't writing until I want to say it was 2000 when we had our first child. That's when I decided I can't write seven days a week anymore. Yeah, because I'd send out an email report every day that included the minor league box scores. But on top yes. of that, whatever I wanted to write about. And that's when I'd gotten to know Scott a little bit, really just over email. And uh, he lives in Austin. He did then, too. Right. And I don't remember if I sort of put the word out to see if anybody wanted to do the minor league reports or if maybe Scott's emails back to me every once in a while. I thought, man, this is the guy. He not only knows the stuff, but he writes really well. And so the next time I was down in Austin, because back then we'd go two, three times a year, because my wife and I both went to school there. Yeah. I said, hey, um, let's go meet at Hut's <laughs> Hamburgers. And, and I, I bought Scott a burger and a beer and we talked for a while. And from that meeting, like he took over the minor league reports. Um, you know what? Let me back up a second. That's not true. Mike Heineman did it first. I remember so I that. Went, so Mike Heineman was the first one. He's another lawyer here in Dallas. And he's the one who I talked to, um, he did not have kids yet when we started our family. So he did the minor league reports at first for several years. And when he said it's too much, I don't think I can do it anymore. That's when Scott and I had that meeting in Austin and he took over. Now, when did you realize, now how did, how did Reiner find you? Do you even know? Yeah, I do know. Um, you know, it's interesting, like you talked about that first email blast. It was in May of 1998. And the email blast was really an email I sent to, I think, seven or eight of my friends that were like super hardcore baseball people. And it was like, it was really just, it's almost like a group text. You know, I right. sent some stuff out, hey, hey, this is what happened in Tulsa last night. Watch out for this guy. And someone else would write back. And I sort of kicked everything off every day, but it was kind of a discussion group. Right. And pretty quickly, like one guy on the list would say, hey, add my dad. And someone else say, had my boss and hey here's three or four buddies and so the list started really growing and by this time it's full of people I don't know I don't know who it was but somebody put Reiner onto it they yes. like forwarded him a couple and all of a sudden one night I get an an instant message on AOL from from Reiner who of course I was a huge fan of I mean, you know the, the hard line been yep. around I want to say five or six years that time and I'm sure. listening to him every day yeah um so he said, man, you know, you and I speak the same language. And I mean, within a couple of days, like he and I were, were IMing every night talking about some player that no one else cared about, like someone right. in class A. And so that was in, uh, that was probably by the end of the 98 season when he jumped on. And then the next year, uh, 99, I uh, asked him if he wanted to join me uh, at opening day because I had a client who canceled like two days before. So I had an empty seat. And um, you know, of course, his show was afternoon. Right. So I knew he'd only have an hour or two before he had to head to the show. And <laughs> right. I also assumed he'd say, no, thanks, but thanks for sure. the offer. He said, you're on. We're doing our show from the ballpark anyway, so I can probably catch five, six innings with you. And so that's when I actually met him face to face. Um, first day of the 99 season. And that Friday, um, and the reason it was Friday, I know it was Friday, is the minor league season always starts on the Thursday of opening week. It's right. always a few days later than major league opening day. Right. So Friday morning is my first minor league entry of right. my email where I broke down what happened at every level and their openers. Right. And I'm driving home from work on that Friday and Mike and Grego read from it. Just basically read from what I wrote. Um, they're the ones who, who titled it the Newburgh minor league report for, you know, I didn't have a title. I would just send these. Oh, wow. Emails. I didn't even know that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And within probably t they, they started doing it by the way, every day, every I remember day. That. Drive I do remember that. And they, they developed a theme song for it to kick off the segment and like maybe once or twice a month, they'd actually have me on the air, but usually not. They were just yep. usually reading from what I wrote that day. And that's when it exploded. So it's really because of Mike Reiner that it got um, the momentum that it, that really carried it and still does. Um, That's how I found because it. Of him. Well, and you know, it's funny. He said you spoke his language. You spoke my language. I had been 
I had followed minor league base. I used to travel uh, a lot at an old job I had, and I would pick up a baseball weekly for the airplane rides. I would leave every weekend. And I mean, I was reading box scores of every Tulsa, you know, all the way down to Gastonia or whatever I could find just to find anybody and see what was going on. And so when he brought up this Newberg minor league report or what, he did something one time, and that's when I immediately was like, well, how do you get on this thing? And all of a sudden, I was getting the emails. Yeah. And I think I've changed emails three times since. So I wish I could go back and find exactly when I did my, I don't even know if it was probably my work email back then, but that's how, and I knew it had to do with the ticket. I, I assumed it was the ticket that did it. Yep. <clears throat> so um, now you, so you go to spring training every year. This first year I got to go and I can't believe I actually got it in before all of this started. This was your first? Very first year to ever go. Wow. And I had been one, now I've got a wife who loved, ended up loving baseball. So she's always wanted to go too, and I have. And once I started doing this, and and I and I said I've got to go now. I said I, you can do it from here, but I need to go to spring training. All I wanted to do, I listened to you guys talk about how close you could get and do all of that, and I got credentials. I mean, I have credentials for Rangers and all of that. But I got there, and I, it was the week before minor leaguers were supposed to start playing. They were just on backfields working out at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, and I basically, for the people, I have a small following, nothing like you guys have, but I was like, I, I had kind of, I think I even reached out to you and said, what time I need to get out there, yeah. um, you know, and, and get out there. So we got out there and I, I couldn't, I, I got to go on the field where they're working out. That was neat. But my, I spent more time instead of watching the guys working out and the players, I was watching how close the fans could get. And I was like, man, you guys have got to come do this. I mean, this, yep. if I'd have known about this 10 years ago, you're literally right there in the middle of where they are. You can get very close. They'll probably stop at least say hi if they can. They're moving back and forth. That's one of the neatest things. And now I've told my wife, get over it. We're going to be going every year. I need to go yeah. later when the, when, the, uh, when the minor leaguers are playing. Yep. That's, uh, to me, the best time to go if you can. Well, there's two considerations. I try to avoid spring break unless it's our own spring break trip because – the crowds are just double during spring yes, break. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Which is fine, but you still can't, like, you know, like you like you do. Like, we're doing some work when we go out there. And so sure. the smaller the crowds are, the better. But I always like going the first week of minor league games because that's when um, nobody from big league camp has been sent down yet. Right. And so before those guys sent, get sent down and everybody filters down a little bit, you're seeing nothing but prospects in those games. Yes. And they always send the, the triple A and the double A team either hit the road or stay home and the class A team do the opposite. So every day in the backfields, you've got two home games and right. they're like 50 feet from each other. So you right. basically like, okay, I want to watch this pitcher more than this pitcher on the other, on the field behind me and who's up to bat and, so you're, you're getting two games in every day. And then the morning, I, you know, I, it sounds like I did tell you, get out there when the gates open. Because to me, the morning drills, Yes, I'd rather see those than any games, exhibition sure. or otherwise. Like, I barely go into the big league stadium during spring training. I yeah. might go once or twice if I'm there a week. But I'm out there every morning watching BP, watching Fungo, watching them doing in and out, whatever they're doing. That's the stuff that, like, you know, I, you know I'm not a scout. Yes, but I'd like, I like to think that I try to see the game through a scout's eye. Although you know, I'm, I'm, I trust numbers and the analytics certainly have made the game better. Um, but I always want to see players. Yeah, I you got an eye test. Get, yeah, you get, you get a feel for okay, that guy's different. Sounds different coming off the bat. There's yep. the way he moves at shortstop or center field, like catcher. You know, watching catchers work, like. I've gone to spring training every year since high school, but one. The only year I did not go was my first year in law school. Um, but the second year I went it was 1989, uh, sophomore in college. And that's when I saw Pudge in spring training. Back on a, one of the back. Now, this is Port Charlotte. Port Charlotte. And um, it, was, it was ridiculous. It was, he was smaller than everybody else. But when you saw him, it was really the feet as much as the arm. The yeah. way that he moved behind the plate and threw the ball, it's like, what in the heck is that? Like, <laughs> this guy's different. And yeah. I remember I, 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 I talked to uh, Tom House that day, who was the pitching coach at the time. Yeah. And uh, introduced myself. You know, he's a fascinating guy. So I, I tried to talk to him as long as I could before he said, okay, enough of you. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I, I said, I gotta go. Yeah. Tell me about this, <laughs> this, this Rodriguez kid. And he said he may never hit, but he'll still, he'll still make a dozen all-star teams. Um, Cause at the time they weren't sure he was going to hit. Sure. Um, but that was super eye opening. And it was maybe it was, I think that what it was either my first or second spring training. I think it was my second, but I was, that was like, I'm coming back every single year. This is well before I was writing anything. Oh yeah. Um, but it, I was like already a huge baseball fan, but that captured me away going out to spring training and seeing players oh. working out. It just, it, it's, uh, it's intoxicating if you're a fan and I'm, oh. I'm, I'm surprised you hadn't been before this year, but I I will totally believe it if you never miss another one. Oh, it, it'll never happen. My wife knew once we left. And she, I said, okay, you understand we're going back. I'm going back. You don't have to go. I'll go back. Then you could go over there and have a beer with a few of the riders after the game or they did trivia and all that stuff. And, you know, I give Levi, Levi right. You write for The Athletic, and so Levi writes for The Athletic. And I got to know Levi a lot last year. He's a really nice guy. And I give him a lot of – crap over it i said you know i went to i went to the athletic because of ken rosenthal that's why i went trade deadline stuff i'm trade deadline i'm useless at work i'm just like this all day long and i said and then jamie went over there that was fantastic i said you were just an afterthought you were the guy writing for the rangers and i was like who is levi and he just laughs at it and goes man that's how most people know me now for most two it's really, I'll, I'll tell you like little, little, little inside baseball on this, like the, the status and um, cachet that Levi has among all the other writers around the country within the athletic, it's all deserved, but it would like, I'm sure it's something he'd never dreamed of. Like people treat him and these are like, some of these writers have been around 30 years, <laughs> Yeah, you know, the names. They're like, oh, this is one for Levi to take. Or like, you know, he yeah. just, he has risen to a level um, as he should, because he's yeah. my favorite, he's my favorite baseball writer. Um, one of my favorite writers of any kind. Yeah. Um, he's earned every bit of it, but for a guy that's only been doing it for, you know, definitely less than a decade, I don't know how long it's been, but it hasn't been much more than five, six years. He's a, he's a phenomenal talent. And you know, and I, I, and that's what I thought of Levi. And do, do you remember the Brock Burke story he wrote last year about the sleepwalking? About the sleepwalking? Yeah. yeah. That's all me. I am the guy that brought that to him. And I, oh, yeah. I bl- yeah, I blog and I, I do stuff, but I don't write like you guys. I, and I, I don't want to write like you guys. I'm, mine's for fun and do that. I'm glad people, but I was interviewing Brock when he was at Double A, and I went down there and interviewed him. We were sitting in the dugout doing the interview. And I always ask, the guys I'm interviewing, I'm like, what's something nobody knows about you? So he tells me the story about, well, apparently I sleepwalk. Then he talks about Joe Palumbo. And so Joe Palumbo got scared to death or whatever. Never thought about it again, Jamie. Didn't think another thing about it until Brock uh, Brock got called up. And I was going to be working that game the next night. And I texted Levi and I said, I may have a story you might could have fun with. And I'm glad I did it because where he went with that story, no way in hell I would have ever gone there. I would have never known the stuff he went to go look at. And he goes, well, can you give me a hint? And I said, I, I guess. I said, did you know that, that Brock Burke sleepwalks? And he went, whoa. And so when I got there that night, we were in the, uh, in the, the, the press box up there. And he goes, so what's the deal? So I started telling him what he told me. And so Brock actually ended up being there. It was the day before he was going to make a start. And so we walked up to Brock, and he saw me, and he said, hey. And I went – Hey, this is Levi with the the athletic. And I said, I think he's going to ask you some questions that are unfortunately my fault. And he looked at me, he goes, I think I know what this is about. Well, it took him about a week, but I kept going, Hey, when's that coming out? It it was phenomenal. What he wrote, what he did with that was fantastic. Yeah. It was great. Oh, it was great. And I, I I give myself, so you know what, if I ever find out a neat story about minor leader, I'll let you know up front (laughs) so that you can do it. I don't write it like you guys write. So, um, so you went, let's see here. So Scott, we already talked about Scott. Let me ask you this. So it's been amazing. I'm getting to do this. I never expected to get a credential. We, we applied for it. I got it. It was great. Um, I've gotten to meet these guys, all major leaguers, minor leaguers, you know, Woody's a fantastic guy. I've met, you know, John Blake, all of those. Well, who's the guy that you've met that you're like, I cannot believe that I'm sitting here talking or I got to meet this guy. Cause you're like me. Look, I know you write as a, you do it, you get professionally paid for it, but you're a fan. You're a huge fan. Yeah. And there's some people that I've met and they weren't even necessarily Rangers, but who have you met that you went, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, um, I don't really get starstruck. Uh, that's a good question. I guess, I mean, this is probably 
sort of a half answer, but when I had been writing for maybe two years, maybe three, um, I got an email from a guy named John Lombardo who was in player development with the Rangers. By then I had a bunch of like Rangers executives were on my mailing list and I knew that, but I got an email from John saying, Hey, uh, Doug wants you to come watch a game with him in a suite, Doug Melvin. <clears throat> oh my gosh. And I wasn't like starstruck by that, but that's the cool. That the GM of the Rangers. And again, like to me, the GM is what like I want to grow up to be. That's sure. you know, when you care about minor leaguers and this, the story I just put out yesterday about the Rangers trade history, that stuff's that like awesome. Well, thank you. But like, <laughs> I, like, when a GM of the team I love asked me if I want to come watch a game in his suite with him, like to me, even though I wasn't start struck meeting him, that was the moment where I felt like, okay, that was the pinch me moment. I'm going to yep. go watch a game with Doug and who knows who else and turn out like all of his front office guys were up there. Oh, that's and it was, that was like, that was, if you're going to like pinpoint a moment where I sort of felt like this can't be real, that was probably it. And I'll tell you for me, and, and it's funny you say you're not starstruck. I, I'm not really either. And I tell you why my mother was uh, married to a guy one time when I was in high school who knew all the Rangers. So I had got to meet some guys and he had always told me, don't ever bug them. So even if I was out and I saw one, I would never go bug them. It was their private time. So that wasn't, I kind of learned not to be the, just gawk at somebody and go crazy. But the one that happened to me last year, and you know, the, the place you eat behind the press box up there where everybody gets food and does all that. And I called my uncle afterwards. I said, I can't believe what just happened, but I go up. So the Oreos are in town and uh, I go to get a Diet Coke. That's one of my things I need. I'll go get a Diet Coke and I'm waiting and I'm looking at my phone and the guy ahead of me bumps into me and rows back, kind of grabs my arm and goes, Hey man, I'm really sorry about that. And I said, Oh, no problem. Look up. And it's freaking Jim Palmer. <laughs> and I'm like, Holy. And he walked in, he goes, sorry. I said, Hey, no problem. He walked away. And I was like, Jim Palmer just apologized and that is the weirdest thing in the world that's when I went okay you need to realize what you're getting to do here yeah, and yeah. to me it's a it's a total blessing I feel like you're probably like me in, in the aspect that I stay out of beat writers ways um, when I'm there I, I go in I, I get stuff for the podcast it's very rare I have to ask a question because they normally ask the question that I'm thinking so I don't have to answer. I just kind of stay out of their way if I can. I'll give them tape if they have it or if they didn't get it or do that. But uh, meeting Jim Palmer was the one where I kind of went, whoa, that was weird that Jim Palmer apologized. So that, it, it's cool. been neat to get to do that. And um, <clears throat> let me see here. So let me uh, – how did the athletic thing come about? I mean, the Newberg report was huge by now. And I bought the – oh, I have a strange question for you after that. Go ahead. How did the athletic thing come about? So late in 2017, probably the summer of 2017, I subscribed. And I was I subscribed because of Ken Rosenthal, just like you. Uh -huh. So I'm a subscriber and I'm a devoted reader. And I just like I start to see what else the athletics doing, you know, across not just baseball, but all of sports. I'm like I am I am so in on this. Like right. I was I was hooked. And then it was either December or January, uh, I think December. Um, I got a call from Bob Sturm who works for the ticket here in town. I know. Yep. And he said, Hey, um, I got something to tell you and something to ask you. And we need to keep this between us. Like, All right. Mm -hmm. You know, no idea what, what this could yeah, possibly yeah, what? mean. I thought he was going to tell me <laughs> I'm, I'm going to another market. I'm leaving town, whatever. Yeah. Um, Bob and I used to co-own a fantasy baseball league team together. So like, <laughs> okay. you know, I, I, I used to talk to him about all kinds of stuff. Yeah. He said, Hey, so, Looks like the athletics coming to town and they've asked me, Bob, to sort of quarterback the team and, and recommend a staff. And he said, I'd love it if you would consider uh, doing something other than your own thing. If you want to be part of this, I'm like, I'm absolutely, I didn't even need time to think about it. I said, <clears throat> I'm in, I'm in, I'm yeah. in. Like, and he said, Hey, and I've got, <laughs> he said, I've got a beat writer in mind, so you wouldn't need to like travel with the team or anything like that. I said, okay, well, I'm sure you can't tell me who it is because you're sort of in your own due diligence process. But if whoever you want falls through, if it's not the same guy I'm thinking of, I've got one to recommend to you. And he's like, well, why don't you go ahead and tell me who that is? And I told him Levi Weaver. 
He said, well, that's my guy too. I'm like, <laughs> yes, because Levi had just started his own thing about two or three months earlier. Yeah, I interviewed Levi, Levi last year. We talked about this, but tell yes. me, it was great. So he had been writing for WFAA for right. Channel H website, and um, he started his own blog called The Upset. Um, he and I actually had lunch a few months before that, and he was picking my brain about doing your own blog and how that, you know, how that shook out for me. And right. he, of course, took it to a new level. He had a staff of writing, you know, Sean Shapiro was going to cover the stars. Like he had a staff in mind, not just, you know, Rangers coverage. Right. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of months later, this starts. And so, yeah. So Bob asked me if I wanted to join. Yes. Levi, if he wanted to join and, and you know, the staff was picking up in other sports as well at the same time. And we launched in February of 2018. So I was part of day one. Um, first story I wrote was about Michael Young. I thought that's what I've got to do. It's like, you know, yeah, that's sort of my guy, you know, has been for a long time. He got to the mm-hmm. Rangers shortly after I started blogging. So like my entire writing career is basically mirrored his baseball career. Yeah. Um, so that's how it got started. Really Sturm reaching out and uh, and me saying yes before he could even complete the sentence. Well, that's am- I mean, I love that because it, you're exactly right. When Levi went over there, that whole staff is amazing. The athletic. When I went over there to join, when you went and said, you, you sent it out and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, now I can tell you guys I'm going to do this. I'm not going to be right for the Newberg Report anymore. I'm going to the Athletic. And I know a lot of people probably went, oh, no. And I went, that's cool. I'm already over there. You know, now you, you're not doing the truck coffees anymore, which, yeah. dude, I, I almost, if I'd have had your phone number then, I would have probably texted you every day going, <laughs> dude, I am sitting here at work. What, when are you putting one out? Come on. Right. Well, so one of the things that uh, once I started talking to management in San Francisco, once we were about to launch, they said, well, you know, you're kind of a different breed. And I agreed, like, I'm not a, I'm not a classic journalist. And what I do is, it's just different. And I Mm -hmm. said, I totally get that. And so I understand if you, if there's things that you need me to like, make sure they fit your um, sort of your model. Yeah. That just tell me. And I'm, and so they say, well, so like, the Trot Coffees, which for those of you who don't know, it's sort of like a trade rumor dump. Yeah. Um, and especially like during like close to the trade deadline and winter meetings, I send out like multiple a day when I was doing the new book. Oh, yeah. Um, the ones where I would do like a run on sentence that went on for 300 words, like Absolutely. things like that. They said, if you want to keep doing those, just like send those to your mailing list or something. It doesn't really fit the athletic. And I said, I totally get that. Um, and I think I did that once or twice. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to find a way to channel it all toward the athletic because it's sort of, I didn't want to like, if I was going to throw my time into writing, I wanted to do for the people that are like brought me on board and said, right. And they're, and you're getting paid. That was was not good news for a lot of my readers who refused (laughs) to go over. I get it. I get it. It's, you know, it's like four bucks a month or something. If you hit them when there's a discount, but I get it. Like for 20 years, I've been doing it for free. So I get (laughs) it when people didn't want to do it, but so at the end of like 90% of my stories on the athletic, I have a section that I call exit below. Yeah. Where I just throw in a couple notes and it's sort of my way of sort of doing a trot coffee. Like if yeah. it's usually stuff that doesn't have to do with the main story I wrote, but just some extra notes like Peter Green right. used to do in the sporting news that I sure. used to eat up his little notes. Oh yeah. So that's what I try to do there. And it's sort of my, my poor substitute for, for trot coffee. Oh, and I, it, it, and for us, if for anyone that was like me, who is kind of a lower version of what you were, I'm that interested in all of that. I lived and breathed by it. I was like going, what are you hearing? What are you, you know, and I was by it. And so I, I totally get why you didn't do that um, and what you're doing, but man, it was, it was fun. I would have bugged the heck out of you if, if back then, because I was, I lived and breathed by it. I loved it. Um, are there, is there anything cool you're working on right now besides that one you just did? I mean, how long does it take you to develop a story? I mean, you write long stories. I actually sort of kept a mental count of how long this last one took me. It took me 29 hours. Oh, my gosh. It's not normal. It's not normal for me. But um, for those who don't subscribe, I just did a story where I um, I selected the best trade the, the Rangers have made with every other team and the worst trade that they made for, with every other team. And, and I, I mean added every Montreal. other team, including every Montreal team. Expos. I added Montreal since that was the only team uh, no longer in existence that existed with the Rangers at some point. So there were 30 best trades and 30 worst trades. So those 60 trades, even though most of them 
I sort of like uh, whiteboarded myself, like this is what I think. I, I did some research to make sure I wasn't missing anything big. Right. A lot of media guides. Um, I even pulled up some old Dallas Morning News archives from the 70s just to see like what the papers were saying when this, this Fergie Jenkins trade went down. And I found some great quotes from the owner then, Brad Corbett, about a couple of trades that I put into the story. So the work I put into this one, and of course, with the, the shutdown that we're all having to sort of, you know, work through, yeah. I had more time than I normally right. do. So I usually do not put close to 30 hours into each story, but I'd say, <laughs> um, I'd say 10 to 15 on most of them, because I'm, most stories that I'm, that I put out in the athletics, you know, where, where the athletic is different from the Newberg report is the Newberg report was just me dumping my thoughts. Like, right. Yeah. I would talk to people. That's what lie. I did. Yeah, I would talk to people, but not on the record. <clears throat> right. So like, hey, you know, um, just for some background or a theory I had, I, you know, you know, am I am I wrong about this class A guy? I talk to people, but now yeah. I do it on the record, and so I'm I'm talking to you know five, six, seven, eight people every story for quotes, and so it I put more time into it just from that standpoint. Yeah, just doing the legwork of what a normal journalist is supposed to do. Um, so. Um, I think your first question is, do I have anything like interesting in the works? I've got um, a couple stories that I'm pretty excited about. I don't want to, I don't want to spill it now, but no, don't. It's, it's sort of in the workshopping process. And um, I've made my pitch um, on both of them, my editor, and we're just sort of working through whether if we want to do both, which one do we want to do first? And um, they'll be fun for me to write. I don't know how much fun they'll be to read, but they'll be fun to write. And hey, listen, hey, I'm going to stop and plug this real quick. I've said this over and over again. I, I plugged with Levi. I'll plug with you. If you're not, it is so cheap to join the athletic. And it's so important. Anything I write or anything I do, I never directly quote anything from Evan from anybody on behind a paywall because you know what I pay for those and you can pay for them too and those guys I depend on you guys and those guys and I'm not going to give you their info you need to go pay the four bucks and get their info that's just fair I get it maybe I'll get an opinion from someone and I might say hey what do you think of this guy like I'll ask you opinion on something in a second and just that's a different thing but I'm not going to tell you the great thing about every trade that went on for 30 teams the best and worst which was fantastic and it leads me to a question I've got about Jonathan Johnson because <laughs> let me tell you something I wrote this last no so my stuff's small I only do about 800 words at the most and I did a top five draft my editor would love you by the way <laughs> he would love if I ever gave him something that was 800 words he'd be so happy but go ahead <laughs> I did a I did a top five draft bust for the Rangers and my criteria see it was my own criteria so my criteria was had to be in the top 15 uh, first round pick. It had to be a first round pick. You can't, you, you know, anybody can pan out from, you know, not hit from the second on, but we all know from the second on, if they didn't go into the first round, they weren't really, you know, really well thought of anyway to get, they were, but they just didn't make it, you know, there. And I said, besides that, they had to, their career basically needs to be over. So Dylan Tate did not, make my thing I, I think Dylan Tate still has a chance to be something and who knows if he ever comes back I gave a pass to David Clyde because I think David Clyde got ruined by Brad Corbett and I mean uh, uh what's his name short and those guys short. that brought yeah Bob short and brought him up so but Jonathan Johnson made my list huh. what did huh. he say to you you made that comment about him I mean yeah. you don't have to say it but you really I, you know I debated even hinting at it in the story so you're not um, going to say it. Okay. Well, I've never, recording. I've never written about it. So I'm okay. not going to like give the full details. Okay. You know just, what? When, say, we, when we stop recording, you can tell me what it is. I'll I, just I, tell you, he was very, he was very unhappy with something that I wrote. Very unhappy. Here's what I remember about. So my top five, I would, I, you know, there's a question. Who do you think is the biggest draft bust ever first round pick for the Rangers? Oof. Um, I know that's, I threw one at you real quick, but. You know, uh, obviously Matt Perk comes to mind, but that's because they didn't sign him. And that's, right. that was when they were going through bankruptcy, but they had so many chances um, to do other things with that pick. I think the one that stands out to me is Donald Harris. He was my number one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just because, I mean, it, that's a great guy to take a chance on in the sixth round. You know, Absolutely. this guy's a football player that we think can play baseball, but you know, when Frank Thomas is on the board and, Number you know, four so pick. You, got, you took this college hitter over this college hitter. It's not even like they went with a high school lefty instead yeah. of the college first baseman. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was pretty brutal. 
Oh, and you know what? And back to back years, because my number two, I'll, I'll give you my top five. It was five down. I had Drew Meyer at number five. I had Jeff Kunkel. That was the oldest I went back, who was thought of number three overall pick. And I remember that name huge coming up and mm -hmm. just never really panned out. Then I had Jonathan Johnson. Here's what I remember about Jonathan Johnson. So I'll say it. You don't have to. I remember when they took Jonathan Johnson, right after that, Florida State went to the College World Series. And so I was tuned in. This is the number one pick. He's pitching. He got lit up. Mm -hmm. And all I remember was, you know, he doesn't – I can understand getting lit up. Any pitcher can get lit up. He just doesn't look – impressive to me he didn't and I was like what this guy just doesn't look impressive to me that's my opinion you know you can comment if you want but I did not think that that guy looked like the number seven pick in the draft at that point from what I yeah. saw from so and then Monty Ferris was the other one so I had him at two but Donald Harris so I feel good I did Donald Harris number one I never understood it I never even knew he was I mean you're at number four pick that's a number four pick yeah. and so that unfortunately I love grieve I love Tom Grieve, and that was two picks he made back-to-back -back years, Ferris and Harris, that never really went anywhere. Yeah. And uh, so, but Grieve is one of my all – I think he was a great GM, to tell you the truth. You know, everybody has a bust, so it's not, not like that. So, um, so what, let me ask you this. What are you thinking now they're going to do this five-round draft they're talking about doing this year? Yeah. Um, you know, I feel, I feel worse for the high school and college crop because – you know, if you're not taking those first five rounds, you can still sign, but there's limits on how much you can be paid. And I think a lot of kids are now going to go to college that probably thought they were ready for, for pro ball out of high school. Yep. And even though there may be a good amount of college juniors that go back for their senior year, same reason. And then they sort of lose a year of professional development. Right. And in high school kids case three years before they can be drafted again. So I feel bad for them. I think like, you know, the t teams will work it out. And the Rangers have always been creative in all sorts of player development areas. And so I feel like they, if anything, the way their scouts operate, they've probably made good enough relationships with kids all over the country, high school and college level, that maybe they can bring in some undrafted, I mean, yeah, undrafted free agents, guys that aren't taken in rounds one through five, and get them signed. Um, it obviously remains to be seen. Uh, for someone like me and you, it's going yeah. to be a lot less fun not to have all these draft pick names to pour over and figure out what they just brought in. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> it's definitely going to be different. Uh, hopefully it's just a one year thing and they don't decide, you know, Hey, we made five rounds work. We're just going to cut it to 20 going forward. Cause I, you know, they've already cut it from 50 to 40. Really they cut it from unlimited to 50 and then 50 to 40, which is where we stand now. And so yeah, yeah a five round draft is not going to be much fun. But so the, it, it so, the is. so the thought is they're probably this is just for this corona or the covid but they're probably going to go up some but I, it's it sounded like it may not be a lot right maybe up to 20 or 10 or 20 or something yeah i don't i don't think they've made the decision but i think they're trying to evaluate all that i've talked to a few scouts about the draft and they said that this year's draft they feel pretty good they've seen what they needed to see but next year's draft is the one where everybody's going to be hurting a little bit because they've lost this entire spring and summer of showcase ball, um, right. know, high school and college tournament play where you're facing good competition every day. Sure. Um, they're missing all that for this year's June, high school juniors and college sophomores. And so they, they said next year's draft is where it's really going to hurt because we, we will have gotten so many, so far fewer looks than we typically do. But they, I think the ones I talked to at least, they feel like they're prepared for this draft because they've seen yeah. the kids as, almost as much as they needed to. Yeah. You know, uh, I got a kind of a funny story. I was brought it up while I go. So you, are you still printing the Newberg report? Well, you're not doing them now, but yeah, um, I stopped at the 20th book, which actually was, was at the end of my first year with the athletic. That was part of my deal with them. And I, I asked them for permission um, to write a 20th book. Cause it just felt like a cleaner break to me to get to 20. Right. And, but that, what that would mean is they basically have to license everything that I wrote for them back to me. Yeah. For me to actually put between two covers something that people pay for on the website, and they were good about it. You know, they was like, "Hey, you know what? For this first year of, of having a Dallas staff, it'll be good exposure for us because you, you know probably have some readers who haven't hopped over." So, right, I did that one final book is the end of eighteen, so it's titled two thousand nineteen. But I'm I'm done with the books. You're done, but I've got a funny story about it. So I bought, I used to get the E, I get the E one. The last five or six I got were the E line, but. And the reason I even did that, I'm, my brother-in-law 
works for a printing company in Illinois and came to me for around Christmas. We were up there and he goes, Hey, you know what? He goes, I, I just got this for you. It was a thumb. It was a thumbnail and he go, or a little thumb drive. And he goes, I know you're a big Ranger fan. I've been married to his, his sister for 10 years. He goes, I don't know if you'll like it or not, but it was just a Ranger book that we're publishing. And I plugged it in and it was the Newberg report. Really? And I, yes. And I was like, Holy crap. And I started showing him my emails. I go, dude, I follow this guy and all of that. And he goes, well, don't tell anyone. I just did it for you. Cause he didn't do that. You know, he was, he's doing good. Then I was like, that's crazy if y'all and i don't know if he still does that it was in uh peoria illinois was where it was do you remember the name of the company i i could find out he still works there I, every, and I'll, print, every printer i've ever dealt with and there have been three or four over the years they were all local now they may have had a peoria branch where they actually did the physical printing um, that's what they I, do i only do dealt the, with like local folks so i didn't even know there was someone in illinois that was involved with the uh Actually they printing. they do the actual printing, and at the time he's actually moved up a little bit in there. But at the time he did the graphic, getting it all into the computer, and they would get, and then they would set the machines to printing. He explains it to me. I don't know anything about that, but he gave me that thumb drive. I plugged it in. It popped up, and I I gotta remember which one it was. And I was like, holy crap, this is the Newberg report. <laughs> and I was like, look at these. I actually pulled up a couple of the other ones. I had a book, you know, and I was like, yeah, I get these every year. And so, and I never bugged him again and he never offered again. So I don't know if it ever went back there again, you know? Yeah. So I took money out of your pocket that one time. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> I gotta admit it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, with what they're doing, do you think, and I've kind of heard Tep talk about this. What do you think of the minor league? Are the minor leagues gonna, are they gonna narrow this down? I mean, it sure looks that way. Um, the preliminary list of cities that I saw that were sort of on the, the cutting block, and this was probably a couple months ago, even before COVID, like they were yeah. talking about contracting the minor leagues a little bit. I don't think any of the Rangers affiliates were, a, were going to be cut, but since they're going to cut back to, I think, four teams per organization, some of the Rangers' current affiliates are going to end up being somebody else's affiliate. Right. We don't know who yet. We don't sure. know, you know if Hickory or Spokane is going to end up being, you know, Cleveland Indians. We don't know that. At least I haven't heard. Right. Um, I feel pretty comfortable that Frisco is going to stay put. Um, you would think that they would probably not mess with AAA. No, that's, um, I don't think so either. So I would think Nashville and Frisco are safe, but between, well, you know what? The Rangers own down East um, and they own Hickory. So I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe Spokane is the one that's in danger of becoming somebody else's affiliate. Are they going to keep high A and low A? Are they saying? I don't know that. I just, yeah. the numbers they're talking about are 120 teams. So you're talking four per. So my guess is that it almost sounds like it's going to still be triple A, double A, high A, low A, but maybe the short season teams that ended up getting um, populated after the draft. Yeah. Will end up just being like a big extended spring training, I guess. Yeah. Um, and they'll just stay in surprise and play other teams in Arizona like they do in the spring. Yeah. And that, do you ever go out to any of that stuff? To which? To the minor do, league games? You, no, no, no. I know you go to minor league games. In fact, I saw you there one night and you were sitting with TR and them. We had got, you know, we went out the same reason. I forget who was pitching that night. It might have been Taylor Hearn. Did you go to yeah, Taylor well, Hearn's debut? I was there for the debut. So, yeah. So I was there. And I, you, you came, I actually, message you that night and I said who I didn't know who Tepid was and I was like who was the other guy sitting with you you go that's Tep and I went oh, okay I'd, I'd heard of him and know him but I didn't know what he looked like yeah. but uh so so Spokane the short a and they've got the do you ever go out what I'm talking about is like to spring training where they have the little league and spring training that they play uh spring ball there it's like extended spring yeah like once camp is up yeah. Um, you know, once camp is over and the, and the season begins, I usually don't go back out, but I do go back out every September for instructional league. Really? Um, which is really <laughs> just like spring training, just with that, no fans at all. And sure. sort of like they bring all the minor league, not all the minor leaguers. They usually select about 80 out of the 200 um, to come back to surprise, play other teams. And the last two years, they've actually done something different where at the end of instructs, they take – 25 to 30 of that group to San Diego and they yeah, play that was cool they play the Padres 25 or 30 top prospects in Petco Park so yeah. you know they pick a weekend where the Padres are out of town and I've gone up there for those last two years for that and it's it's phenomenal because the Padres have a great system and just to see well the two systems you know putting their best up against each other is something pretty special so I Isn't do that, go I do see those games is that where Bubba hit the home run he hit a it is yeah hit a, hit a rocket so I've went, do you go down ever to watch Hickory or down East? 
I have not been to either one. Like earlier, like renditions of where the I went to Savannah back when the Sand Nats were a Rangers affiliate. Yeah. Port Charlotte. So I, I I've been to different minor league towns, but I have not been to Hickory or down east, and and I feel bad about that because I you know both are great baseball towns and the parks yeah. are supposed to be really nice and and obviously i care about the players playing there i you know i should try to figure out a way to get out that's that's where actually i went to west virginia and watched hickory play in west virginia and we, my wife and i were on a trip and we made a point of it and that's where i met sam uh sam god that's a big boy wow same hub. yeah and that night uh sam hit a double that night but the guy that i was impressed with was doro and he kind of ran the team. Now he's probably not, he'll, he's a, at best a utility guy, I think. Yeah. Uh, but just uh, kind of the leader on the field, it felt like. And that, uh, what's his name? The left handed first baseman, uh, big kid. Uh, he's kind of fallen back. It seems like he, anyway, he had a, he had a home run that night. Um, my mind's blank. I'll think of it. I'll text it to you later. Um, but uh, okay, so we got, we got that last thing I want to talk about. Now, obviously, all of us, our favorite, you and me being big Ranger fans as long as we've been, the biggest Ranger memory in our lives is game six. Were you there, uh, 2010 and when? I was. In fact, my, at the time, six-year-old caught a foul ball. Oh, my gosh. I was there. Uh, the wife and I were up top. That's where we always would sit. But um, I was there, too. But besides that, your favorite Texas Ranger memory of all time, whether you were there or not, I guess, you know what, when you were there. All right, I'll give you two. Okay. Um, from just a pure, like, Ranger, lifetime Rangers fan standpoint, the game that Derek Holland threw, game five of 2011 oh. World Series, when Napoli won it basically with an oppo double. Yeah. That was unbelievable. Just to see them come back and win and put themselves on the brink of winning a World Series, like, yes. That was I was there night that night. The, yeah, that, that was a night when the crowd was almost like Game Six the year before against the Yankees, where almost every pitch there was a buzz. In the oh crowd. yes, a groan or a cheer, and like everybody was. I mean, I'm sure the concession stands were empty. I never, I never left my seat, and it looked like no one else did either. Yeah, so that's one. The other one is a little. It's a little different. And again, I don't get starstruck, but in 2010, I went to all but one. Rangers playoff game including the road oh wow you went on the road okay I like it was brutal on me like having to catch up on work stuff and it yeah. was like stupid expensive but like <laughs> I have waited a lifetime for this and it may never happen again I did the same thing so I didn't I go to the Tampa, game away game so I was in Tampa Bay for all three games of the you know game one two and five of the yeah. ALDS and I can't remember if it was game one or game two I feel like it was game two I end up sitting next to Jim Sundberg oh my gosh yeah. just in the stands yeah you know, not press box or anything like that um I think I you know what I bought my seat from the Rangers a lot and they happen to have I, I said you just have one if not I'll go on StubHub or something but if you yeah. have one seat I'd love to get a decent seat and, yeah and I'll buy it or whatever I'm not well, yeah. I paid for it I yeah, paid yeah. I paid full price for it yeah, but I ended up next to Sunberg, who was also there alone. He wasn't with his family or buddies or anything. Right. So I wasn't starstruck because I was sitting next to Sonny, even though he was one of those guys in the mid seventies, like when you oh, and I were God, yes. his... one of my favorites. But the thing was that game. I don't know if I just like took a chance, but I did decide I'm going to try to game plan. I'm going to call this game with Jim Sunberg. Oh like, my gosh. Here's what I would throw here. Here's what I, I, let's put the runner in motion. And he was into it. Like for that entire game, he oh and I gosh. are playing manager and pitching coach and catcher, you know, yeah. what, what pitch are we throwing here? And it, and Texas won the game and it was the coolest, maybe the coolest baseball experience I've had because that was one of the great catchers of his time. And to, to be able to like sponge off, like just how he was thinking through a game as a oh. catcher, and like throwing my crap at him and like yeah. he's like yep and you know he disagreed with me plenty but the yeah. times he's going yep that's that's the pitch throwers like because he called his own games so yeah 
of yeah. course. And uh, that was that was really really cool and lucky. And I've obviously I've never forgotten it. Although I can't remember if it's game one or game two. <laughs> that's I'll tell you what. That's a fantasy come true there. That's really neat though because I for me besides game I was at I did the same thing you did. We had bought a small season ticket package that year in 2010. They sent out that le- letter about do you want to buy a playoff ticket? And you bought a strip. That's what they called it, the strip. And I looked at my wife and it was going to be five grand or whatever. I don't know, $1,200 is what we were way up top. And I said, you know what? I just feel like this year it was after Cliff Lee and all of that. And I said, I really think that this is the year. I said, I, let's just buy this and do it. And we did it. And well, we had, you talk about a blast. I was at every one of the home games. And it, I had all my years when they struck out Alex Rodriguez to go to the world series. I literally had tears all in my eyes. I mean, I was like, I could not hold back. I mean, and my wife was just, oh, I was like, I, I didn't know if I'd ever see this. But, uh, okay, well, listen, we're going to watch that. I'm going to get a plug from you. I get one from everybody uh, from The Athletic. You're listening to the Ranger Nation podcast. I want to get that. And we'll wind that down. I think that's basically it. We're gonna, I want to do this again. We'll do it shorter. Obviously, this is the big get to know Jamie for my listeners. But uh, during the season, maybe jump on and do a 10-minute this player's coming up or whatever, and I'll run into you out there some. You Don't be surprised when Max makes it to varsity. You'll probably see me at a game or two <laughs> just because I try to find local games if I can, and I'll go run out. And Berkner is where we live, but we go to Richards. Uh, you know, but anyway. So, but I'll try to catch one, and I'm sure if Max makes varsity, I'll probably run into you there too. But. And you know that JP is the Berkner coach, right? Yeah, JP's Berkner. That's my okay. kid goes to his camp. Went to his gotcha. camp. I've got a younger one that's a baseball player. Got and that, well, this year he's backed out. He's not going to play anymore after this year. He's, oh, he never yeah. was a select kid. No, I never got into it. Yeah. And so I wasn't going to spend the money. And I'm like, look, you don't have the passion I do. It's okay. He likes football and track. So cool. Too awesome. cool. So give me a Jamie Newberg with The Athletic, and you're listening to the Ranger Nation podcast. Oh, you want me to say that? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, this, this is Jamie Newberg with The Athletic, and you're listening to the Rangers podcast. Say it again. The Rangers, Rangers Nation podcast. Rangers Nation podcast. Okay. okay. This is Jamie Newberg with The Athletic, and you are listening to the Rangers Nation podcast. Jamie, this has been a great one for me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on with me. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Jamie a swelled head here. I've gotten to meet a lot of neat people. I've met ma- former major leaguers, major leaguers, minor leaguers. I've met John Daniel. I've met John Blake. I've met Woody. This is the one I've looked forward to the most. You're kind of like uh, – because you're just this nerd like me that <laughs> watching you do it. It's been the funnest one I've done. I really appreciate you coming on, Jamie. Yeah, it was fun. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, we'll do it again. That's Jamie Newberg from The Athletic. Guys, I appreciate everyone that listened to this one. And we'll, we'll, uh, don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Ranger Nation Pod, at Ranger Nation Pod. Follow Jamie. What is it, at Newberg? Newberg Report. At Newberg Report, go follow them. Join The Athletic. If you're not signed up for The Athletic, that's on you, man. I mean, it's cheap. It's great. It's the best sports writing in the country. And, I, I look, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not taking the blame for it. I've tried to promote it too many times. Hey, let me throw something else in there right now. They are doing a 90-day free trial. You can't beat that. I mean, you can, you can get The Athletic for three months for free, and there's no commitment afterwards. Um, you know, I think they probably take your information, but you can tell them before the 90 days are up or when the 90 days up that you're not interested. But 90 days free right now, I mean, how, how can you pass it up? Well, yeah, look, they run specials that are way cheaper than I pay for it now, and I don't care. But, I mean, guys, if you're not joined by now, the specials they run, they've got a huge following. The best riders are gone to the, to the athletic. It's amazing. Jamie, thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. And like I say at the end of everything I ride, at the end of every one of these, nerd out. <laughs> that's it thanks man hey thanks, man. man we'll talk to you later james all right bud thanks see ya